Welcome to the Talent Equation Podcast. If you are passionate about helping young people to unleash their potential and want to find ways to do that better, then you've come to the right place. The Talent Equation Podcast seeks to answer the important questions facing parents, coaches, and talent developers as they try to help young people become the best they can be. This is a series of unscripted, unpolished conversations between people at the razor's edge of the talent community who are prepared to share their knowledge, experiences, and challenges in an effort to help others get better faster. Listen, reflect, and don't forget to join the discussion at thetalentequation.co.uk. Enjoy the show. Well, I'm delighted to be joined by uh, Will Roberts to the show. Will, welcome, a belated welcome. I know we've we've missed each other several times trying to schedule this call in. A lot of it my fault. Some of some of it just schedules and you flying all over the world doing amazing things. Um, anyway, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Great to uh, great to join you. Starting point as always is um, you, you've got a really rich history working in this space of all things physical activity movement coaching all those sorts of things I wonder if you could just give give the audience a potted history of um, how you've come to where you are now yeah so um, potted history I guess is is undergraduate degree in sport and exercise science and um, was really interested and and thought I wanted to be a physiologist and uh Working all... performance sport and realised actually I a didn't understand a lot of what was going on at, at eighteen and b wasn't that that passionate about that even though I've sort of come back to that later actually so I'll, I'll talk about that but yeah sport and exercise science degree um, ex failed athlete and worked out in the first couple of years of, of university I was really passionate about coaching and was turned on to that by some some key people at university and. Um, yeah, then went on to do masters in coaching and was pretty lucky to work under uh, Jed Roddy at, at Team Bath um, and some really great colleagues there and and actually did most of my learning there about coaching and you know would love to get into to talking to you about that and the impact that mentors can have in my own development and uh, in terms of then getting into to the sort of field I'm in now. Um, I was lucky at Bath then to, to get a job as a teaching fellow. I'd spent a couple of years working there with the scholarship programs and working with performance athletes and, and TAS athletes and then took a teaching fellow role. Um, was there for about six years and then across to Oxford Brooks to work with uh, John Briley and Danny Newcomb and Martin Morris um, uh, in the first instance, just setting up the coaching program there. Mm-hmm. Um, did about eight years at, at Brooks. Um, it flew by, but it was a long time. And, and now at um, University of Gloucestershire as a senior lecturer in sport and exercise science. Um, and you know, some of the things that hopefully we, we get to talk to, to about today are based around sort of coaching and physical activity and, and bring a lot of those different experiences uh, to bear, I guess. And you, you mentioned... Um about this idea of you've come back to the the sports science side of things yeah how has that come about well I I sort of spent a long time uh, I really got into the social sciences and and, you know learning and teaching and coaching and for a long time was was absolutely convinced that coaching was all about the relationship and and the coach-athlete relationship and the impact that sort of the understanding of of social and cultural contexts has And, and I still believe that strongly but I found that when I was I was coaching and trying to make sure that um, I could impact on my athletes, you know, certainly early on in my uh, my coaching, I wasn't always sure what was going wrong because I couldn't see what was was happening from a human movement perspective. And so I've come back to the, the physiological but biomechanical um, principles as well. And and you know we're we're always learning. So just revisiting some of that that stuff because I found that, that those relationships were key 
but actually when you were trying to improve performance and and detect errors you can only do those if you if you know what to look at and what what to look for so trying to understand how the body moves um how it responds to the problems that it's set how that it uh, reacts to the environment that it's in whether that's itself or indivi- uh, you know opposition or whether that's the practice that you you've got them in um trying to help athletes and coach them i found that it was really important to to really understand what what was going on uh, and that's certainly you know the emphasis of the work we're doing now at, at the university of gloucestershire is to make sure that the coaching degrees there um do have really strong emphasis on you know the leadership the coach athlete relationship those types of things but that the sciences can can underpin then what what the coach what the practitioner is looking at um, when they're coaching and so i suppose then um if we were to take carl newell's triangle and we're looking at the various points on that triangle your your th- this area of inquiry currently around um what the athlete is capable of very much coming from that the individual area of the triangle as an understanding of what they're capable of doing because i suppose for a long time and this is an important point i think a lot of people are at the moment i think just just dealing with two points of the triangle which is um you know just looking at the task you know and looking at the environment yeah not really considering the individual within that and so i suppose you're placing a bit more emphasis there yeah, we're trying to, to do that. I think that, um, you know, the, the ability to manipulate task constraints is is really accelerated in the last 15, 20 years. And there's some great work by the likes of Keith Davids and, and Ian Ranshaw and, and uh, you know, Duarte Rajo, Rick Shuttleworth, all, that, all those guys that are really working around this. And, and you know, exposure to them actually has, has got me thinking about lots of those things in terms of the organism. The criticism of the constraints approach if we get into that early um t- tends to be that it that we don't um we don't emphasize the individual enough and actually the the theoretical and, and conceptual ideas do they do understand that the individual is important that the capabilities of that individual is important and so i guess the work we're trying to do at the moment is just bring that to bear um uh, and not to just uh leave that on un- undealt with or, or unsaid you know make sure that we do understand the organism and the capabilities and the impact that our that our coaching might have on them is, in, is really important it's interesting um you mentioned rick shuttleworth and i mean one of the things i think he began his um i guess undergraduate career in learning was uh, very focused on biomechanics and still has a very strong underpinning basis around the idea of, you know, kind of like, you know, human movement being at the center of this and then, and then, you know, wrapping the task in the environment. And he actually often says that having, having a bit like you've just said there, that having that really strong understanding of, of human movement gives you then uh, a far deeper and richer uh, appreciation of, you know how you then can design environmental constraints and task constraints in order to bring about changes in human movement absolutely i think um you know i would absolutely agree with that and and add there that that certainly in terms of you know the the, the search strategies that the the athlete has got will be linked to those capabilities as well that they'll they're looking for information that that suits either their history, their experiences, or, or their their action capabilities. And I think we we need to start to understand that. Um, you know, one of the, I've just I was just out um, working with some coaches in Australia, and, and we were having a chat uh, about the fact that they had this athlete, great athlete that kept dribbling all the time, ran with the ball, wanted to cut inside, dribble with the ball. Oh, you've got to pass! You've got to pass! It was like we he doesn't he doesn't have to pass. Um, so, so he's not going to look for that. You, you want him to pass because you know what the adult game looks like. But actually, in terms of his capabilities and, and where he is with the understanding of his body, he doesn't need to pass. So either create a game where passing is the solution and you might get him to start to attune to that or accept that we need to do something else, you know, whether it's changing the, the challenge or changing the age group that he works with or whatever it is. But we tend to get caught up in coaching with, they ought to do this because I know that in 10 years time they might have to 
versus understanding where they are as an individual now and where their capabilities are now and and trying to understand how to develop that and how to design practices that help them uh, to answer some of those future pr- challenges and, and solutions or problems that they might have uh, and need to solve. So yeah. I, th- I think that's absolutely the emphasis is trying to understand the individual at the moment. And and just to go a bit further then on that, then you, you mentioned that, you know, it's a particular area of interest currently for you around this idea of understanding more about human movement. And I think it's a fascinating area when you do start digging into it. Um, from that perspective, though, um, what led you, what led you there? And you, you mentioned earlier that, you know, you couldn't always see if you like, see where it was going wrong or see the problem that needed to be solved. It's pretty hard to design a, any form of, any form of, any form of um, intervention without having yeah. the ability to visually recognize that. What was it led you there? And, and then therefore what the sort of connection to that is then what are the things that you're working on with athletes at the moment around that area? Yeah. So the, the, I mean, it, it, it root, it's rooted um, in some time ago, I guess that, that I was, I was designing practices that I thought were great, you know, all, all the whistles and, uh, and what have you. And it, I felt really great about the sessions because yeah. they were really uh, detailed and, and quite complex and there were challenges built in. And, and I'd sort of start the session and do that thing, you know, this is sort of 10, 12 years ago, and stand on the side. And if it, if it was working, great but I wasn't always sure why or what was going on. Mm. But if it didn't, I, I found myself in a world of trouble because I didn't know how to correct it. Mm. So I was so, so, so focused on the session mm. that actually when it came to watching something break down, if it was really simple, someone wasn't controlling the ball, you, you can go in and, and help that. But I didn't know why it was that they weren't controlling the, you know, was there too much going on? Was it too busy? Was the practice not appropriate for them um but and it was so almost the session design was um was my safety net Mm, mm. rather than being really simple and just saying what does this athlete need at this time you know what are their capabilities how do i design a practice that can help them develop those those capabilities but i wasn't uh, and i'll get into this i wasn't satisfied with the well if they can't handle this practice just drill them (laughs) <laughs> because the, the context uh, was so important and you know i was aware of, of that stuff so even if it was 10 or 12 years ago um working with people at bath that were exploring dynamical systems and, and constraints-led approaches that it wasn't as simple as just well just drill them in how to control the ball because there's more going on for them and so i think that was when i started to realize that i needed to understand more about how the body worked, how it, how it operated, how it moved, but also how it made decisions, what it was looking for in terms of um, what, what the individual might be looking for uh, in terms of information in the system and how they were making those decisions. And, and almost whilst the design of, of practices is really important, it can't be in the stead of really important information about our athletes. And, and that's, so if I rewound 12 years ago, that's where I was at design great sessions not know enough about the athlete so you can't actually coach and this is the the sort of i guess a bit of a hobby horse of mine at the moment is the criticism of constraints or games based uh, or or those that advocate it actually is just well the game is the teacher well the game isn't the teacher the game is an environment where our athletes can learn you're still the teacher you're still the coach you've got to get in and support them and intervene Mm. and i couldn't do it because I didn't know enough about what was going on for them in terms of human movement. And so I, you know, Danny and I, certainly I I talked a lot at Brooks to our students about coaching as a merry-go-round. It was almost too complex and you didn't know when to jump on, you know, it's constantly going around. You can see that horse come around and you want to jump on, but it's too quick. Mm. Well, having the sort of scientific background, the information to be able to, coach the individual almost felt a bit matrix-esque you know everything was slowed down oh gosh i can see what's happening right mm. i can intervene now it's it becomes so much easier to mm. to step in and coach because you've got enough information that you can you can actually impact on the athlete and and um shemp in his early work you know to, in terms of talking about experts versus beginners as you start that journey towards 
expertise as you become more expert you're less focused on the nitty-gritty of planning mm. and it's because you don't need that crutch you, you've got you've got an, um, enough information where you, you feel comfortable to to deal with the complexity of what's going on in front of you and i think that's in terms of projects there's there's two one is reviewing what we do in terms of teaching uh, undergraduate and postgraduate and trying to get those sciences in to support our, our coaches become expert um, and the other one i guess that we're really interested in at the moment is at the primary age end of things um, we're looking at a project called boing which really is about trying to develop problem solving and movement solutions through well-designed practices that that can allow us to really focus on developing young people uh, in terms of their movement, but also the other things that, that we think sport and physical activity can be so great around, you know, collaborating, empathizing with others, solving problems, becoming leaders, those sorts of things can all be embedded in a really well-designed program. So I guess that we're, we're trying to do that at, at a different age range than one I'm used to, to working with directly as a coach. So that, that's a beautiful segue into an area that I'm really keen to discuss with you. Um, as one of the originators of Boeing, um, and I have spoken a little bit about Boeing on the podcast before, but not in any great depth. Can you, I guess, walk us through a little bit about, firstly, the genesis of Boeing as a concept, and then a little bit around where you, where you see it going and what, and what the aspiration for it is? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so um, we're quite lucky at, at Oxford Brooks when I was there. Danny and Danny Newcomb and I um, both sort of ended up in the coaching team at, at similar times. He was a couple of years after me. Um, he was very much a physiologist that coached at an elite level. I was a sort of sociologist that um, wished he was a physiologist that had ended up coaching. And, and so we sort of had really similar discussions around what coaching looks like. Um, at the same time, we really wanted our students to experience coaching because we were talking theoretically about things and they're sort of looking at you as if to say, that sounds like it might be a good idea, but I'm not convinced. And we wanted them to, to be out coaching. So we, we, we bid for a small pot of money with Oxford Brooks to set up a social enterprise that really only ever aimed to be um, sending our students out on placement. Um, at the same time, we'd met a chap called Doug Struthers, who was sort of involved in Ella's Kitchen, um, the, the baby food stuff. Um, and save, my, save my bacon many a time, says Ella's Kitchen. Save my bacon many a time. So I think the fact that, uh, you know, I was looking at him a bit, bit leery-eyed. I just had my, my first... Uh, my daughter then Maddie looking at him a bit bleary eyed and he said Ella's kitchen I just sort of breathed this time really <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're you're the guy that's uh, that's in my fridge at the moment um yes yeah, so, so he, he they developed a concept essentially to to make food a bit more fun for kids but mm. his passion was sport and physical activity and he he was sort of we were having initial conversations and he was saying I want to make sport and physical activity more fun for kids um and we were, we were saying, well, we want to put our students out on placement. And uh, Danny and I were very much into constraints and stuff, as you, as you know, but also exploring the world of uh, physical literacy. And I'll, I'll sort of, I'll explain later how I think those fit really nicely, physical literacy and, and constraints. But we were chatting about that. And, and over sort of a period of a 12 months, we turned the, what was just going to be a placement uh, project into something where we we got some funding through through um, the university and through Doug to look at how we might design practices so that when our students were on placement instead of spending hours doing lesson plans they spent all their time thinking about how they coach individuals because we'd done the lesson plans for them so Danny and I and a guy called Sean Longhurst who who we sort of recruited as a research assistant at the time and, and managed and oversaw Boeing for us um basically spent sort of 18 months designing 130 games linking them to the national curriculum stripping sport out but putting problems and and human movement challenges in to a curriculum 
Um, and then, and then we sort of sent the students out and said, look, here's, here's the games, here's, here's the practices. You spend your time looking at what's going on for the individual. And, and, you know, they were beginner coaches, so they'll have made all the same, um, errors that, that beginner coaches, uh, make. Um, but when we were chatting to them and reflecting with them in, in lectures, it was really clear that they were starting to look at the sorts of solutions that, that young people were, were finding. They were really focused in on individual learners. Um, not to say that it was easy to solve those problems, but they were really thinking about the needs of the learner rather than all the other stuff that tends to come with coaching, like setting up and designing games and you know, going from progression to progression to progression. We've all done that thing, you know, where we're on the, we're on the clock as a beginner coach. Oh, five minute warm up. Now I'll do this. Now I'll do that. You know, and that was all taken care of. So the, the developments they were making were, were just fantastic. And I think we, something like 90% of our students that had been on a Boeing placement got a, got a primary PGCE place. So we were starting to see some, you know, what I'll call soft uh, data come through uh, and, demonstrate that there was some impact so there's a bit of the genesis um since then we've done various research projects so we've mapped the impact with the university of bath on um in, in a with a control group and with boing group we've looked at the impact on physical activity on teaching lessons on the behavior of students we've done some fairly uh, qualitative work with young people and the teachers to to gauge the impact of that um danny and i have done some work around the, operationalizing it pedagogically and, and got some research around that as well so we're starting to see some signs that it works and some areas that, that definitely need uh, development but we, we've started to see some impact so in terms of your question around aspirations i think it's to to try and train coaches to, to, to do this. So we were sending students on placement, which is great, but that's not really what schools need. Schools need teachers to be trained or teaching assistants to be trained or their practitioners that look after their sport um, uh, delivery to, to be trained. So we, we've taken some of that learning from the first five years and, and we've tried to package that now into a, a training program. And so the, the aspiration now is to look at trying to get that the curriculum into many coaches as many coaches hands and, and teachers hands as possible and youth workers hands as possible and to to see if we can understand how to implement it that way because that's that's really what's needed i think for the workforce is not people going in and constantly solving a problem for them by turning up and coaching or sending students on placement but but actually upskilling the workforce and, and i guess that's where where our focus is at the moment now you mentioned earlier about the idea of constraints and physical literacy and how they fit together. But I, I know that through the history of, of bullying as a concept, one of the things that you have come up against is a few challenges in terms of how people perceive the way, the very way that Boeing approaches the development of what we're going to call physical literacy, I'm not a fan of the term, but let's call it that because it's an accepted, accepted term. Yeah. And then how the kind of what you might call the mainstream education landscape sees the development of physical literacy and how there's been a little bit of a, I guess the gears have ground together a little bit there and it hasn't always been an easy thing in order to get teachers on board. And so that hence the idea of looking at a different way of engaging engaging people through coaching etc cetera, etc cetera. but i just be worth just exploring that a little bit because i think that's an interesting area of discussion yeah it's not it's not always easy to to sort of make this a linear conversation so if i jump around a bit then sure. you know i apologize but it's a non-linear podcast so it's no problem. Uh, well there you go <laughs> <laughs> um i think that you know for, first thing to say is is uh, obviously margaret whitehead's work around physical literacy is is well established i think what people have done is taken that to mean a sort of uh, super version of fundamental movement skills. And that's not what she meant, I don't think. I mean, you, you'd need to ask her, but um, really physical literacy in terms of that definition. And, and I do some work with the International Physical Literacy Association. What, what we're keen on people understanding is that it's more holistic than just the physical. Um, probably the physical part of the, the moniker throws people off, but it, it really is to try and sort of explore how people become 
confident and motivated and have knowledge to to be physically active but but it needs to include those other things um and that's where i think sport has a problem and the teaching of sport has a problem because it it is a very physical thing and certainly when you start to get into elite sport uh, although they are addressing issues of well-being and, and sort of holistic care of athletes actually when you get into sport we, we tend to think complex um, elite no space for error uh, and so we don't we tend to spend time developing people physically so they can cope with that and so I think that brings some challenges and, and certainly when we start to write Boeing um, and and deliver Boeing, when you add the cultural understanding of netball, for example, as a game, um, people will want to play netball. They want to play the version of netball that they've seen and been taught. And and you see netballers move. If you put them in another sport, they still do the stop start thing. You know the 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 three strides, and they they still catch in the same way. Um, and so th- that's problematic because we're we're we are cultural beings. We are trapped in our understanding of something and, and its culture. Mm. So we need to, the, the, the term physical literacy, I think people are trapped in this notion that it's just the physical stuff. And so um, we need to move beyond that. So we try to do that in Boeing by stripping away sport so that it was just movement. But then, you know, you talked about the challenges we've had with teachers they've got sports day or they've got their sports teams and they want their young people to get better at sport because they've got to play the local school and they want to recruit parents and, and you know, it's got all those complex things that, that actually we don't um, give enough credit to people that they do have to operate within their local context and they do have to understand what their community needs and those sorts of things. So we've got a real challenge there around the, the sort of traditional culture of what PE is and what it ought to do. And, um, you know, we've been criticized with, with Boeing that we just want to have fun and it's, it's all chaos and movement. And, but that's, that's what young people want to, they want to move. You know, if you leave them long enough, they'll create their own game and it'll look a bit chaotic, but they'll know what's going on. So we've just tried to capture with Boeing some of, what we think the evidence says around what young people need and they need to move and they need to solve problems and they need to do that on their own. They need to do it with others. And sometimes that looks a bit chaotic, but that doesn't meet the needs of our culture. I guess that's, that's where I want to get to with that. And our culture is driven by sport and it's driven by league tables and it's driven by measurement. And if you can't demonstrate that little Jennifer has thrown it 10 yards in week one and she's thrown it 15 yards in week six and therefore she's progressed, then we have an issue to meet with Ofsted or parents or whatever it might be. And so that, those, are, those are the sort of challenges we've had, I guess, is the traditional expectation of sport and PE and the traditional expectation around what progress looks like. And what we've tried to say is, well, progress in young people is, is going to be stop, stop, start. It's not going to be linear. It's going to be complex. They might develop physically, but then not emotionally. And actually, we want them to develop emotionally as young people as well. So does it matter if they can throw a ball further than their peer? Or should we actually be focusing on their individual journey? And a lot of the development of Boeing is looking at those those types of things and trying to strip away some of those issues, I guess, in the way we've designed uh, the games. And it, I think that that's like this, like you say, this sort of, if you like, socio-cultural challenge, which is physical education. Um, I'm not sure those two, those two words should ever go together, by the way, um, but that's a different discussion. But physical education, traditionally, in terms of the way it's been applied, something to do i think partially like you say you've you've alluded to this idea of a culture of league tables and measurement and a curriculum that is written in such a way that it is um really it seems pretty procedural and yeah. in order to meet the outcomes as specified within the curriculum you can understand why there's a series of interventions which as as you quite rightly quite rightly point out are designed to 
perform some kind of it's almost like a skills test you know if you can do a jump you know a standing jump from here to here then you know and it gets longer or whatever or it's more aesthetically uh done in a more aesthetically appropriate way then therefore that is seen as progress yeah regardless of whatever functional purpose it serves so for me placing the idea you know it's almost like decontextualizing movement the very thing that you know one of the things we're trying to rail against on this podcast so decontextualizing the idea of movement into a series of almost like you know performance subroutines uh, you know it's it's like it's almost like the performing seal mon- uh, idea i mean I'm, I'm painting a very bleak picture and i know it's not like this everywhere or or sport is a traditional game form yeah. Um, that's done in isolation so like you say netball is different from football is different from rugby and no two no two practitioners can could ever be conceived of being able to deliver essentially what is an invasion ball game yeah. you know oh no no it's all we've all got to understand the techniques of each sport and teach them appropriately otherwise the whole world's going to fall apart so yeah. against that socio-cultural backdrop you guys come along with your fancy down ideas of uh integrating Oh, and by the way, sorry, and physical is completely devoid of, like you say, um, social development, um, emotional development, all that psychological, all that. No, no, just just focus on the physical bit. That's the only bit we're interested in here. We do all the other stuff elsewhere, somewhere else. We have nice chats about that. Yeah. Right? But the idea of we can play sport within a sociocultural context where relationships, collaboration, connection, um, you know, caring the, the the five C's as was the C system as it's now called. These ideas of emotional connection, all those sorts of things, can all be done in an integrated, coherent way that also looks at decision making, problem solving, l- allows movement to emerge as a functional solution to problems presented by the activity itself, non-sport specific, but developing the kinds of movements that would be a, that would be useful in a range of sport specific contexts should any of these children ever be so motivated as to want to go and put, participate in some of these sports activities um that no 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 sorry no it's all just too messy can't get that no can't we just go back to the physical box please because that's really easy that's a very bit that's i guess that's been a pretty challenging space to exist in because you're almost trying to create a market that doesn't exist I don't, yeah, I don't want to use market language, but you know what I mean. No, it, it is. It's re- it's really challenging, and um, you know, I, and I understand why it's challenging for schools, for example, when we sort of have approached them and said, "Do you fancy doing this?" Um, that that they've got all that stuff going on for them, and that and they've got people leaning on them to produce those types of results. So it, it is exceptionally challenging. Um, the other thing is we are coaches entering a teacher's world so there's another cultural issue where you coaches you don't understand teaching um and you know just the language we do there. all too well <laughs> yeah um and that's the thing i think we've got those are our barriers that we need to overcome is you know this is about movement it's about learning it's about young people we happen to have created the the context and the world where teaching and coaching are separate things but they're by and large the you know the the same activity um just with different demands placed on them i guess and and different motivations and yeah uh, all those sorts of things so yeah it's been it's been really challenging but we're starting to get some some headway i think evidencing it is really important so it's not just sort of three or four people sat in a room coming up with a crazy idea it's actually we're, we're starting to develop some evidence that something's going on we've got a long way to to go but Sport has a place, and and this is you know I almost feel like it's this is our this was our year one lecture at Oxford Brooks. You know what's the difference between sport and PE? Go, you know we spent twelve weeks trying to unpack it. But sport has a really important place, but so does PE, mm. and we need to work pretty hard to understand they're not the same thing, and we need to disentangle them. Um, but you ironically though you're almost trying to intertwine them, aren't you? You're trying to pull the best of PE and the best of sport and put them into a kind of a new a new offering that actually perhaps serves the needs of the part. I mean, your your evidence suggests such, doesn't it? In the sense that, and I know the challenges with the evidence is that you know some people go, well, hang on a second, it, that could be down to this and it could be down to that, yeah. and there's a whole range of variables. But you've certainly done 
peer-reviewed studies that are basically saying that kids who've engaged in boying have a far greater opinion of sport and physical activity and engagement in sport and physical ac- activity. I mean, regardless of whether that's just deliver- who, who delivers it or it's the activities themselves, it's got to be a combination of both. Yeah. But that's uh, good in itself, is it not? It is good in itself. And we've made, you know, really, really good progress in, in sort of three or four years that we've been when running the project. So we're, we're really pleased with that. And But... And I guess the reason I said that, you know, sport and PE, we need to understand they're not the same thing. And by that, I guess I mean, culturally, they're not the same ah, thing. Sorry, yes. Um, and people have their connotations of, of what that might mean when I'm engaged in it. And sure. we've, we've, for a long time, we've taught sport in PE and said, oh, but don't worry, it doesn't matter that you're not good at netball. But actually, that young person is experiencing other people being really good at netball Hmm. so they're they're going to disengage and that might be them forever so and that's i guess what we've tried to do in some ways we've we have merged them very much as you say but we've trying to disentangle the the cultural notions that come with it and for a long time i've i've sort of likened it to the study of music at the moment what we do is we say to young people it's really important to understand music and learn it because you'll understand about rhythm and culture and you can appreciate timing and um, uh, self-reflection. And there's all sorts of things with, that come with it. And we do that in PE. You need to understand movement and interacting with others. And, but in music, you're not made to form a band and stand up in front of everyone and perform it. You, you know, you, you can just enjoy it and learn it. Whereas in sport and PE, we've, we've quite often, it, it's the subject where you are made to perform in front of your peers. Uh, good, bad, or indifferent. You've got to perform and you're constantly judged because it is such a physical thing. And I guess what we've tried to do with Boeing is remove that so that people can just experience their movement and their movement solutions quite often in a collaborative way without the judgment of you're good at that, you're bad at that, you need to get better at that, whatever it might be. Um, and and that, I think that's been the powerful thing for Boeing. That's been why we're starting to see evidence because young people that otherwise wouldn't be engaged are engaging and they can find their path towards becoming competent and at moving, becoming com- confident, becoming motivated to want to move without the worry of, but we know that that young boy or that young girl over there is really good at football. So I don't want to play against them. You know, and, and this and, is just yeah. games that have got, challenges that you need to solve either on your own or with others that are regenerating that that pose different challenges that that you can solve with your body uh, or or through decision making and i think that's really that's really key and and there are if i'm right in thinking now you've got this ever-growing uh library of different games and activities in something called the play tank yes um which i'm a subscriber of and has again saved my bacon on a few occasions Come on. what i find myself doing in the play tank and i don't know whether you're supposed to do this and i imagine you probably always imagine this is taking an initial play tank because uh, they're all non-specific and I'm obviously working in a sports specific sense most of the time so for example yeah. I'll go into the play tank and go oh there's a nice idea and then reappropriate it for say a cricket context or a hockey context and, Absolutely, and then just yeah. give different implements and different equipment into the into the hands and play like that and it's really great for that just stimulating you know kind of ideas yeah I, I think the you know we've so we're about 130 games now um some of them we've had to uh uh, remodel some of them we've had to get rid of over the last five years they haven't worked and we've we've evidenced that they don't work that might be the practice design might be the age group was inappropriate the competencies were were not able to do with it so we're about 130 games um it's free now um which is which is great so we, with some funding we've made all of the games free online to teachers and coaches they can just sign on um at www.boingkids.co.uk put your email in, get a password. You can access all the games for free. Um, And it is exactly as you say, this is about context for coaches and young people that we can't possibly know. know, Some of the games might be inappropriate in New Zealand for a cultural reason, or they might be really appropriate in the Southeast where this issue might be going on and the game suits those people. But, But equally, as you say, different sports will have different needs as well and it is very much about trying to be part of 
a solution for coaches and teachers and not be the magic bullet because if we can give some people a few ideas a few principles get them to understand how they might design effective games for um their young people and then run with that and design their own then absolutely that's that's what it's there for and the, and uh, I, I tell you the other area as well where i found found it really useful is um either warm up um or you know kind of arrival stroke warm-up activities that yeah. are cognitively engaging so it's a brilliant way of um like getting a group of young people because often um, you know, like any club context, you know, I've got 45 under 11 cricketers on a Friday afternoon. They don't all arrive exactly at the same time as much as you'd yeah. like them to, you know, they start dribbling in and this, that, and the other, and, and, you know, you get the bulk there, but you want to be, and you want to get them going, but you've got more coming in. So as a really great way of, pr- of providing a kind of arrival activity that people can just pick up, the kids tell each other the rules, yeah. join that team, you join that team, off you go. What's the rules? Oh, you do this, you do that. What are we trying to do here with a range of different, act- different balls or, or different, um, implements or whatever it is yeah and not always necessary interestingly enough my kids it's not always the ones that are directly relevant to the sports activity that are the ones that are the favorites yeah they'll just pick up this different oh it's a great game just it's just a great game in itself um usually i'm selecting the ones that have got some degree of relevance like so for cricket there's throwing or there's catching or there's um you know fielding or there's um striking or some element like that but in general that's what i find And and then what what i often find is I then go, this is the annoying thing, by the way. So this is the the area where I've got a bone to pick with you, which is I'll go, okay, now we're going to go into the main set. What? No, we're having fun. Oh, all right. (laughs) Go in. We keep going. And then I run out of time in my main session. So that's the only area I've got a bone to pick. Well, that's that's great to hear. But, you know, we we have tried to design them where the the sort of the types of movements that we would want to elicit in sport are are hidden in there. They're embedded in there. You know, we're not trying to say that you don't, need to um develop certain movement capacities we just we just don't think that stood in a line you know throwing the ball at at stumps it's your turn now it's your turn now it's your turn now it's your turn is that effective whereas you know there's a there's a game where you need to throw at a at a target in order to be successful Mm. they they will you know pick the ball up on the run start to organize themselves to be able to throw that effectively but then it regenerates because someone else will catch that the other side. And so they're still doing the sorts of things that we might want them to, to do, but, um, and this might be a little bit controversial, I guess I'm not convinced that there is a fundamental movement to be able to, to do something that we have, we are yet to come across, Mm. um, yet to, yet to imagine. So, you know, I, I was taught, you know, foot alongside the ball, knee bent, head over the ball, pass, and then spent 15 years never really passing the ball like that. So <laughs> what is it fundamental for? Now, it might be that, you know, we, we talk about principles rather than fundamental movements. When you are throwing, it is, an effective, it is effective to have a strong base. And we see people, whether they're throwing a baseball, cricket ball, javelin, or getting themselves in, the, in a position to serve a tennis ball, for example. Mm-hmm. There are only certain degrees of freedom there are only certain movement solutions for the human body to order itself to be able to um, move an object Mm. so you'll get into something that but it it needs to be very individual the sport will change that context the Mm. game will change that context so rather than start with basics to add and then eventually get complex we think we can create games that are quite complex well where people will find movement solutions and we don't necessarily have to start with the basics as as i was sort of taught when i when i started coaching because if if you start with the basics you're already assuming you know what the problems are that 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 athlete's going to face or that young person's going to face and and actually they're going to face so many different challenges so yeah we, we rather than start with the basics and layer up to something more complex and then play a game we've we just in, in terms of our philosophical idea around Boeing, we think that we can actually start with a challenge that they will then find a solution to. Mm. Now, the key bit is that doesn't mean you don't coach. That doesn't no. mean you never step in. You're still going to help them. if you. And, and this is like almost going back to the start of our conversation, I guess. Um, if you've got the scientific knowledge to be able to error detect, then 
then you're able to step in. So if they're throwing ineffectively or they're not able to solve the problem, we, we can still coach. We just start, our start point is very different, I guess. We're, instead of starting with basics and drills and moving people through the complexity of, of a task, we're starting with a challenge. We're getting them to solve that themselves. We're getting them to self-organize. But then we will still coach. We can still impact on them. We can still help them with um, different movement solutions, I guess. You know, Is there a wide enough base? Why is it that you aren't getting into that, that wide enough base to be stable, to be able to throw the ball? And, and I think that's, that's an important message. It's not drill or game. It's not coach or don't coach. It's try and develop a wide range of tools that help you affect an impact on a young person's journey and use all those different tools when appropriate for that young person. Mm. And we just think Boeing might be one of them. Mm. Mm. It's, it, <clears throat> you've got me on a, a particular area of, um, of interest because I, well, this podcast is no... Um, uh, is no stranger to controversy. So the <laughs> fact that it's a, a potentially controversial point that fundamental movement skills might not actually be a thing, um, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that because, again, it's made, it never made any sense to me that the idea was that there are certain biomechanical movements that if you rehearse them enough that they become um, you know, something that you do on a, in a very repeatable way that that would potentially lead you down a route that you would then have all, almost all of the movement tools you're ever going to need for any particular form. And then that would lead you. So the first thing is the very idea, that concept itself makes no sense to me. There's, and secondly, I have a really big problem with some of the evidence that's, that's out there, that some of the, um, well, so, so proposed evidence that, fundamental engagement in fundamental movement skill activity leads to long-term participation yeah um, i mean i think i've read that research and i've got a whole load of questions and challenges about it uh, not least of which um more often than not who the cohort is makes quite a big difference because kids who are into sport who do fundamental movement activities then go on to have a lifelong participation in sport stands to reason doesn't it because you know <laughs> they were always going to but just circling back to this point around the idea of fundamental movement skills being a preparation for all forms of other physical activity i actually think it could be hugely counterproductive um i had a podcast discussion um not so long ago where we talked a bit about this idea of creating this kind of movement groove so the idea being is in really early early years there becomes this kind of movement groove that almost becomes so deep that it's very difficult to then move out of that groove in order to become adaptable. Yeah. And I think that adaptability being a key form of successful movement in any environment requires us to experience a rate, like you said, you know, a range of degrees of freedom around any particular movement. And then at a later stage in life, we can begin to refine down to the more optimal movements as we begin to specify in the kinds of activities that we're, we're going to take place in. But yeah. we're doing it the other way around. We're yeah. trying to groove fundamental movements for a imagined future activity. And yeah, it just doesn't feel right to me. No, and I think that, you know, that there's no there's no doubt that the human body only has um, you know, certain responses to be able to kick a, an object, for example, it, it will organize in a certain way. Um, but you know, that will change the size of the ball, weight of the ball, the, the um, target that we're trying to hit the, whether it's lofted, whether it's on the floor, whether it's, you know, all those sorts of things. And so to, to stand and practice one answer, what we've got to recognize is what we're doing is practicing that one answer. We're not teaching them the fundamentals to be able to kick in any space at any time, anywhere. Um, and so I think the, the challenge for any approach that we take is to start to question and evidence transfer. Mm. You know, what does actually transfer? What, is it this? And, and so I'm, you know, we have a particular uh, approach, but, I know that we still need to, to gather evidence on that approach to be able to empirically demonstrate that, that that's going to be impactful. But I think both sides of that, that argument have got that job to do. Yeah. Um, 
So we're, we're trying to expose through the design of practices, young people to lots of different movement solutions that will uh, impact on them in, in terms of their future capacity to move. And, you know, everyone will drop out of sport at some point for some reason, mm. whether that's age or capacity or time or whatever it might be. So we've, you know, I, I think that certainly with the Boeing project at, at primary age, what, what we're trying to do is engage them, give them some of the opportunities to explore movement, but also collaboration, develop their social skills. Um, that means that they, they might be more engaged in being active. And, and you know, certainly that's the evidence in, in terms of the early work, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't need longer term uh, development and work and just on that I guess the transfer question we did a really neat um, little uh, research project with England handball and we took a group of kids that had done Boeing and not traditional sports and a group of kids that had done traditional sports and you know it's very really small just a pilot but it offers some interesting questions that the, the young people that had done traditional sports were great at handball to start with and because they understood what games looked like and invasion games looked like. But they played it like their traditional sport. So if they were a netballer, they were throwing and catching like netball. If they were a rugby player, they were, they were moving like you would in, in rugby and football and so on. And the kids that had done boing but not traditional sports um, were finding movement solutions that looked like handball. So the goalkeeper was saving with his feet and I was sort of saying, oh, shouldn't he save with his hands? Don't you need to coach him? And the guy from England, you know, Mark Hawkins from England handball was like, no, that's really good. That's the movement. So that's the answer to that problem in handball that we often coach them to, to move like that. And so it was interesting that they were, they were drawn to solve the problems of that particular game in terms of the size of the pitch and the number of opponents and the rules and the way that the, the ball was moved around. And so, I think there is a great deal of work that needs to be done in in that understanding the cultural connotations of sport, but also the issues around transfer are really important. And, you know, we, we need to understand that before we start saying this approach is best or that approach is no good. Um, yeah. So it, it's really about trying to evidence it for, for either side. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really interesting though, to, to just, just even to notice the idea that, the context in which movement is learned has a resiliency or a um, a tail to it in the sense of the way the young people then choose to interpret novel sports yeah. environments yeah. still still connect I, yeah. it's interesting because i uh, my cricket group actually took my cricket talk about my cricket group a lot but it's like a melting pot of different sports so yeah. you basically have all the kids who play all the different winter sports basically melting into this cricket teams you've got the rugby kids football kids the hockey kids um and then what's interesting is how the different socio-cultural um uh, uh approaches then clash together yeah it's quite interesting how yeah. behaviorally even just behaviorally never mind in some of the other d- dynamics um you know the how within a cricketing domain how that's still really quite evident absolutely there's an imprint there and you yeah. look at the sort of socio-cultural work um our university students, you, you can tell the sport that they play, <laughs> yeah. you know, and it's not to prejudge them, but it's almost like a, a cultural belonging requires that certain sports wear flip flops and, and a t-shirt, even though it's freezing, but they'll wear a, they'll wear a beanie at the same, you know, you can say, look, there goes the hockey player or the rugby player or the <laughs> rower or, so there, there is that, there's that cultural imprint, but I think there's a movement imprint as well. And that's, that's the danger of the fundamental argument. Yes, you'll teach them to move and do that, there's a good chance that they will always you know think that that is the movement solution and when they're actually tasked with something else mm. ca- can they do that and it's exposing you know young people athletes to all sorts of different movement solutions in order to um support their development mm. and so that's, that's the key thing from from your perspective just sort of shifting gears a little bit away from this because we are starting to broaden our conversation but in in terms of just 
the wider landscape around coaching and what's happening in coaching and the way coaching's sort of evolving and the different challenges. You're at the coal face of this, obviously, because you're leading degrees and you're constantly looking to source additional information and all those sorts of things, which are going to help you with providing this information to this new generation of coaches emerging at yeah. university. Where do you see the kind of the next, I guess, big, I mean, I probably said at the start of this, you've, you've just recently authored, co-authored a book with Ian Renshaw, Keith Davids and, and Danny uh, on yeah. the constraint led approach. And um, I, I said earlier, I'm, I'm making my way through, through it, you know, in a non-linear fashion, jumping around yeah. a bit. Um, and what you've done in that book, which I think is really nice, is taken some of the theoretical concepts. Concepts. I think you've, you've tried to provide the best explanation of those without getting too heavily academic there's obviously some elements that you just can't you can't really do justice to without dealing with it in an academic way but you've also then tried to show some good case studies of application as well um within different sporting domains some that you wouldn't think of ice climbing for example being one and how constraints are uh, imposed there and all those different things so in that space you're right at the coal face you've got a book out that's talking about different aspects of the constraints led approach it feels to me like constraints led approach is is beginning to gather a little bit of mainstream momentum if you like still not 100 percent sure quite being applied in the in the right way but where yeah. do you see being those kind of next steps the big challenges what's what's coming over the horizon so to speak yeah so i think that the challenges are as almost as you've alluded to or said there are, are around the application of um these i think the the key thing that i've sort of learned over the last 15 years i guess involved in higher education is that um that there needs to be an output it can't just be a talking shop and and keith and ian are, are really leading the charge on trying to work with people to to make this applied and understood for for practitioners and i think that for me is the the big piece of work over the next five ten years i guess is to to operationalize lots of this to turn it into good practice to learn from people in the field what the challenges are because um that that's that's a big space that that needs filling i think um it's starting to be done you know people like danny doing his phd martin rothwell at, at sheffield with with keith david's other you know lots of people that ian's and, and keith have worked with in australia and, and new zealand as well um people like rick obviously uh, and i think really it's it's about trying to understand how learners respond to it what what the challenges are of delivering this you know in the swimming pool in the grass uh, or on the grass sorry on the court wherever it might be what does it look like in an applied sense and, and can we learn from people that are engaged in practical settings what what the challenges are um that that's a that's a big piece of work and i think demystifying lots of the myths you know uh, often challenged on what well, does that mean you can't coach 1v1 then well no you can still put constraints into 1v1 no one said this this was the game sense approach this is not just all playing games but fundamentally that you know we want people to be able to play sport or develop physical activity habits we need to respond to them as an individual and what their needs are and you know we're pretty clear in the book that 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 could be 1v0 that could be kicking a ball against the wall but there's less context and it's less representative. So be careful about what you think is going to transfer when you practice 1v1, uh, 1v0, 1v1, 2v2, 3v3. Um, you will attune to different things in a 3v3 than you will in a 15v15. So no, we're not saying playing 3v3 is going to make you a master at the 15v15 game, but well-designed and attuning to people to the sorts of things you want them to, to develop and learn can be transferred and will be effective if you then also expose them to 15 v 15. So it's, it's demystifying some of the, the challenges that I think quite often are, are erroneous and no one has sort of claimed. Um, uh, and also then understanding what it looks like in practice and really trying to develop practitioners um, ability to, to apply it, but also learn them from those practitioners. So, in terms of th this application piece because i think if i'm i think that's for me anyway where where i'm increasingly finding myself living 
yeah uh, applying some of the theoretical concepts and essentially just conducting my own experiments around yeah. you know and i almost see like every every session is to a certain extent an experiment i'm testing a hypothesis around um right so here's an intention uh, we might be discovering a particular aspect of gameplay there may be some technical components being built in whatever it might be it might be a, it might be a, com a combination of both and here is a activity or a practice form that is designed to uh, draw out uh, a player's level of awareness of different opportunities for action within that environment and then we'll begin my role then is to step into that space periodically to determine it, it to, to either make the attention more acute or uh, or or to just take a slightly bigger view of it but also just to sort of pose questions and con and considerations and uh, ask players to explore different avenues that they may not have noticed those sorts of different things so that's kind of my design and all the way through that whole process these ex this, this, the experiment that's going on is a is the practice form enabling the intention in the way we hoped rarely does the first practice form do so it nearly yeah. always needs needs some form of manipulation absolutely um and then um and then also what level of intervention is required by me and what is the most appropriate intervention required by me in order to provide the guidance often as i reflect from sessions if if an activity requires a lot of my intervention um, and when I say a lot, more than around about 20% of my intervention, 25% yeah. of my intervention in the activity, then the reality is that activity probably needed some additional manipulation or it's probably, it may be the wrong activity. But that's almost like the constant sort of experimental piece of work that's going on is, and it's not by no means, you know, it wouldn't, be, wouldn't stand up to scientific rigor, but I feel like that's what I'm doing. <laughs> Testing a hypothesis around an activity form and then determining based on reflection how many manipulations were needed how many interventions were needed as to then what the how how we could then make that activity because i suppose a part of me being being a, an ecological sorry aspiring to be an ecological purist which i'm not but let's imagine <laughs> is the idea is you can design the perfect activity that kind of just in, in, in the, it's like the best backyard game ever where kids are mega engaged and and it's like turbocharged learning going on and literally i just observe and have very little intervention and that for me is like the that's the perfect design i don't think it exists but you know it's the search for that isn't it that's part you, of the fun here you, you have to let me know if you ever achieve that <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll be the one coming to do the learning. I, look, I think, um, you know, yeah, I, I don't think you get there because, you know, you, well, we've all been there. You only need one learner who's had a rotten day <laughs> and uh, you're not, you're not going to achieve that no matter how hard you try. So I think it's, it really is about playing with it. It's about having some principles for your, your context. You know, we talk about in the book, we talk about some principles for, for session design that those are sort of based on our experiences of, of coaching and of, of research but you know it, and, and those I think are helpful um, otherwise we wouldn't have I guess committed pen to paper but uh, it's about trying to create sessions that meet your learners needs and an environment that meet your learners needs and sometimes that might as you say mean limited uh, input but other times it might mean lots of input because we, we really need to to support them and, and their learning is yeah further away than we'd like it to be from from understanding you know and, and I think that it, it's having the enough knowledge but also the confidence as a coach to and the humility to be able to continually adapt our practice so yeah I've designed this game I'd really like to not say a lot to you today it's not working I'm going to have to say a lot to you today I need to intervene lots um, finding out what worked with them so that you can you can go back to that and and see why it worked and what worked and what didn't and having that flexibility to to be able to meet your learners needs you know these are complex relationships let alone we're asking them to do something that's quite complex mm. so i think we just need to keep checking ourselves when we're coaching and, and, and trying to respond to the 
to the learner in, in terms of their individual needs, but also in terms of their development. And that's not going to look the same every time you, you coach. One of the things I get asked a lot is, how do I know it's working? I don't know what your thoughts on that are, because <laughs> I haven't always got an easy answer for that. No, it's a good question. I, I got into this a little, a little bit with uh, someone the other day. You know, how do you how do you capture that? And and there's anything from well, they're successful. You know, they're they're scoring lots or they're assisting lots in in your sport. But but actually, is that success or does that just mean that they're stood in the right place a, a lot? Or are they are they the big kids? So they always get to do that. Or they? So I think you know. And, and working with Danny a lot, he he's very clear, uh, as I am, around setting goals with your with your group. You know, what are your learners' needs, but also what are the group needs. So, successes can are, are we achieving the things that we we've, we've agreed we're going to try and achieve? So, if that's lots of entries into the final third, for example, so are we making good decisions to get into the final third in, a, in an invasion game? But if you come against the team that just defends really well, we might not be able to do that. So it's having other measures and being able to go and say, right, did we, did we try and do that? Were we attempting to do it? What, what were the things that meant that we couldn't do it? Can we coach those things? Can we work on them? Um, again, I find it really, and, and perhaps this is the criticism and a fair criticism, but uh, of constraints based approaches is that how, how are we going to say that we've been successful? Um, but, but I think that, is also the case for other approaches as well. That that actually is a performance problem and not a particular uh, methodological or, or philosophical approach is problem. That's that's the problem of sport. It's quite difficult to capture. Mm. Um, we, do a, we do a research methods question at, at university. Who was the best team? You know, how, how would you rank the best team? Oh, well, it's the team that won. Okay, so, you know, um, they won one nil, but they had twenty percent of possession. Are they still the best team? Yes, they are. Well, did they play the best football? Was it lucky? Was it you know? And and there are quantitative and qualitative measures. And I, I guess the point that you're asking me that we need to answer: there are quantitative measures. Mm -hmm. You know, have they, have they done it? Haven't they done it? But there are also qualitative measure, measures. Are they working well with their teammates? Are they trying to do it? Are they making good decisions most of the time? And I think it's bringing those data together based on your context and what you are trying to achieve and what the goals that you, you have set are and trying to create that picture of, of success. And that is perhaps not a great answer, but I think otherwise you get, you, you falsely start to measure reductionist ideas. Yeah. So we'll, we'll measure whether or not they, um, how many times do they get to the breakdown of the, uh, of a ruck or a mall mm. well and actually then if that's the performance measure and we're dis dis deciding whether or not the athlete's successful based on that they'll spend all their time trying to do that mm. but actually we might want them to do something else because we want them to make a decision based on the game in front of them yeah well uh, you told me i had to get to five rucks in a game so i got to five yeah. but actually not getting to the fifth one might have been a better decision so we've got to be really careful i think when we we design our metrics for success that we're not then attuning people to to those metrics and they're not actually looking out for the other stuff that's going on uh, there's a famous story that will greenwood tells when gps first came in to the international setup i mean it's obviously years ago um and uh there was one point there's like a break in play or something and will greenwood's doing laps or he's running around somewhere and and there are people like, what are you doing he's going i'm just getting the getting the mileage up because that's what they're measuring over there <laughs> <laughs> well that that that's it isn't it and i think we've got to be cautious of that look it's, look it's not a great answer to your question it's a really good question how do we design how do we decide what success is but that's that's a question that we face in sport more generally that doesn't belong to one approach or another yeah well one um, of the things that i find i think that is is an area that people sometimes get get trapped by or tricked by is not linking their success their success measure to the key aspects of what they intend in the activity so for example they'll go right and this is one of my criticisms of more traditional linear approaches they'll go right we want to develop a technique 
which would often be interpreted as a skill because people intertwine the two things. But let's say they want to develop a technique of some kind. So the players spend time doing some form of repetitive exercise that then develops technique. And then that technique has been improved. So there is visible, visible, um, tangible evidence of the technique improvements in that practice form. We have achieved that goal. And then usually then there is, you know, sometimes some, some, some form of reward, the reward being the game at the end. And, and I know we're probably saying this, oh, surely that's gone. <laughs> it really hasn't, right? Um, so there's the game. But we almost forget about that aspect. I had a discussion with a, a really quite knowledgeable coach who I'm sort of working with um, a bit saying oh yeah there's the there's the game there's a game there and then there's it was a carousel designed activity so there was yeah. there was four activities two were designed on t- based around some form of technical development but admittedly done in a contextualized way they weren't decontextualized but just done yeah. in sort of reduced numbers type split scenarios yeah and then there were two forms that were kind of quite that were just more bigger game and one of those in particular was just free had no yeah aspects to it and i said well at least you'd want to put in some little rule system in there that would emphasize or place emphasis on whatever's been learned in these two technical aspects of the carousel so that they've got opportunities for application in that context and they're drawn towards it oh no we just want to let them play just want to have some free play in there now that's actually a particularly well designed practice in a in a more linear practice there's a technique learned technique is learned we go into a game we just forget about the technique altogether yeah and and then go crazy when we don't see certain things emerging when we go into the competitive environment so for me i think that's where people perhaps get a little bit tricked is they're not because really for me the only real measure is transferability now one thing is you so you've got your practice activity that you, you you're at, you know you kind of reduced variability activity now we're going to try and increase variability to a point where there is some form of representative game activity taking place in in our practice and we're seeing how transferable things are and actually the rate of progress towards that technical sorry towards that game like activity representative activity we determine based on how much transferability we're seeing because we don't want to take too big a jump and see big jumps being taken as well yeah. and then when it comes to, and particularly in youth sport, when it comes to weekend game or match or whatever it is, let's now see how much of the practice game to transferability is now taking place in the competitive context. But rarely do I even see that happening because that's the ultimate measure of whether we're seeing success. What are we doing in the practice environment? How is that transferring into the training game environment? How is that transferring into competition? never see any of those measures connected in fact they're almost like separate separate items on a menu different different courses on a menu that aren't really designed to complement each other yeah and i, and I think that the, you know the first principle in the book around session intention is is deals with a, with a lot of what you've you've said there is designing practices that that are actually going to achieve the thing that you are setting out to achieve and then starting to map that across the different uh, spaces that you then put your athletes in to, to see if that transfer takes place. You know, we, I spent my whole life as a, as a young footballer, uh, keeping the ball five times before you could score a goal. Um, you know, on the basis that it would be good for my touch and good for possession, but actually, you know, and that's great if the session intention is, um, keeping the ball but actually I, I want to know why I would keep the ball when I would keep it how I would keep it and if you've already you know you've over constrained me by saying I've got to keep it five times the answer might be passing the ball forward quickly on the first attempt well I'm not looking for the space to pass forward if I know I've got to keep it five times so on the match day what's typically happened then is you say well we practiced keeping the ball um, but why didn't you go forward when you saw that opportunity well, we practiced keeping the ball. So I'm going into the game attuned at keeping the ball. So we've got to make sure the intention of our session matches the design. So if the intention is um, keep the ball all the time, great, keep the ball all the time. But that doesn't look like the game. That's not what we have to actually do to the game. That is keeping the ball is one response to one problem or a couple of different problems we might see in the game. And we want them to attune to the sorts of things that mean let's keep the ball now. Well, when would I keep the ball? Well, when I can't go forward. 
Okay, yeah. so you're already attuned to the fact that I can't go forward, so we'll keep it. And actually, you know, you listen to top coaches at the moment, so, and I'm talking about invasion games, and sorry about that, but they want their athletes to be able to spot those issues, you know, spot the challenges. When, when can we play forward? When can we do that quickly? If we can't, then we keep it. And so making sure that our session intention is is uh, designed and, and linked to our practice, making sure that we're not over constraining and stopping people looking for the sorts of information. As you've said, make, making sure it's representative. It looks something like the game and, and, we can then see if those sorts of decisions are, are mapping across to our game. And, and that might be one of the, the measures that we start to, to look at in terms of success. But, but if, you do, if you do decide that you want to apply a methodology that is purely about ball retention, you know, let's say you decide that's just the, 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 what you want to focus on. You're going to take yeah. away some of the other variabil- uh, variability of when to go forward and all those sorts of things. It's purely about let's just look at ways in which we can Manip, you know retain possession of the ball yeah at the very least then when it comes to competition have a metric in that yeah don't forget about it and go right let's just worry how many times we get the ball in the back of the net that's yeah. obviously still one of the metrics but at the very least say what we're going to look at today is obviously how well we play in the competition in, in the in the game form and goals we score but we're also looking to measure how well we retain possession because that's what we're working on at the moment yeah instead and, of and forgetting did- about it all no, but and and did we just keep it for the sake of it? Did we miss opportunities to go forward when we could have done? And we could, you know, and so that's why I'm saying that you have to build those quantitative and qualitative measures of of success in. But they need to be a, agreed with the group. Yeah, they need they need to be a part of that. And quite often we impose the the like I said earlier in the in the chat of a sort of very reductionist approach at, uh, to measuring the success. We'll measure isolated bits, and that can be quite dangerous. Well, as always, I've looked at the clock. And part of the reason I've looked at the clock is because I've just got a buzz on my phone saying that I've got a meeting I've got to attend in 10 minutes' time, which there is always go. the way. I think, oh, my God. Um, and, you know, an hour and a half has passed, and I feel like there could be another hour and a half of conversation as we're just – feel like we're just getting warmed up. We've just done the arrival activity. Yeah. <laughs> but um, uh, I've got the rest of my day, and so have you. Um, uh, Will, we've talked a lot about Boeing, but also, um, you know, people might want to reach out to you in the role that you've got in, de- in the day job at the university. Some might be interested actually in getting involved in some of the degree offerings that you've got and things along those lines yeah. um, or whatever it might be. How does one go about reaching out to you if they want to make, make contact? Yeah, be, be more than happy to, to chat to anyone really. Um, so wroberts1 at glossglos.ac.uk for, for any and all uh information i guess or or just reaching out touching base challenges uh, as well you know because we're trying to develop these ideas I, I by no means think we've got all the answers we've just got some ideas that we're trying to play around with so you know whether it's to get involved or to challenge or just to have a chat you know more than happy to to get in touch with people and what's the the boing url again just for people yeah it's www.boingkids.co.uk you can get all the resources for free on there now and again you know i'd invite people to to use those and, and mold them as they see fit but but also they've got other ideas or any sort of challenges and and uh thoughts for us to to get in touch and there's a there's a, a you're developing a as I understand it they're developing a training offer for coaches so people will be able to become and, and become more obviously I think most people could could utilise the games but to learn a bit more about application and the approach and all those sorts of things there's an opportunity for coaches to to tap into that there's going to be some training courses coming along the line in June yeah call. yeah we're just trying to finalise all that at the moment but um the you know working with uh, various um, partners to develop that that uh, training package at the moment and hopefully that'll be free to coaches and, and teachers to come along we'll have some national um road shows with uk coaching and, and we're going to try and get uh, get that message out to, to coaches and teachers over the next six to 12 months i guess brilliant great stuff looking forward to that right thanks a lot will no i really appreciate you having me on thanks mate
Thanks for listening to the Talent Equation podcast. If you like the show, then please consider supporting it by leaving a review on your favorite podcast player, telling your friends about it, or even becoming a hero and show your appreciation by becoming a patron. Just head over to thetalentequation.co.uk and click on the Becoming a Patron button at the top of the page. 